Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about the part of the universe that we almost never talk about. The really really dark and very mysterious part of the intergalactic space. Today I'm going to talk about what we know about it, but I guess there's going to be a lot of things that we still don't. Let's discuss this and welcome to What The Math. Many years ago, when I was still teaching, I asked my students a question. Where do you think most of the matter in the universe hides in? Where do you think we can find most of the so-called baryonic or visible matter? And almost automatically, pretty much most of them said that it's in black holes. Supermassive or ultramassive black holes like the one you see on the screen. This is Sagittarius A star in the middle of our own um, galaxy. The thing is, that's not even remotely close to the truth. As a matter of fact, we need to really go far, far away before we discover where most of that mass is. So first of all, uh, only a very small fraction of mass is represented by black holes, because a lot of the mass in the universe is still sort of in gas form. It's basically free-floating. It hasn't really become a star or was a star and then exploded and this mass was released again. So most of the mass is really just dust and gas like you see on the screen right here, although this is a slightly more exaggerated, more beautiful version of it. Most of it would not even be visible. But also at the same time, if we really wanted to discover the biggest source of mass, we would have to go outside of our own galaxy. We would have to go into the middle of the empty space known as intergalactic medium. So today we're going to be talking about what is really happening here in between galaxies and why this is most likely one of the biggest mysteries we still have, but also hides a lot of answers to the, well, everything. Whatever we discover here in the intergalactic medium is actually a lot more important than what we discover in the middle of our own galaxy. So let's begin with the rough representation of the shape of everything in the universe. And what you're looking at here is a randomly selected cube roughly around 100 or several hundred million light years across and this is the representation of the visible matter in our universe and every little thread that you see that's essentially the so-called galactic filaments now it might be a little bit difficult to imagine what we're looking at here until we use a simulation known as the illustris project which allows us to simulate universe by sort of uh, visualizing various types of radiation spectrum and also of course dark matter so this is what galaxies would look like. Uh, there is a randomly generated um, elliptical galaxy in the middle there, a few other smaller galaxies around it. And if we were to look at the distribution of gas here, you would see that there's actually a lot of gas present pretty much everywhere around the galaxy as well. But what's more interesting here is if you were to zoom out with the galaxy still being right there in the middle, but very, very small now, you would notice that there's actually a lot more gas all over the place in the middle of nowhere. And if we also start looking at dark matter here, we'll realize that they form kind of like these tunnel-like formations that we refer to as the galactic filaments. And these are some of the largest structures out there in the universe. And along these um, tunnels or along these filaments are other galaxies. So pretty much every major galaxy out there in the universe is connected with these filaments filled with gas, occasional stars, a lot of dark matter, and um, if we were to zoom out here a little bit more, you would start seeing these formations pretty much everywhere. Now, if I were to remove the gas and only leave the stars behind, this is really what it kind of looks like. This is just the dark matter and the visible matter, which is kind of what you're looking at here as well, except that this is in three dimensions. And for the most part, um, if you were to remove all of the galaxies from the picture, you would still be left with roughly around 80% of the entire mass of the universe. And we're talking about baryonic mass only, not even dark matter or anything. So essentially, there is more stuff out there um, that makes up stars and um, us, of course, that is outside of galaxies than inside those galaxies. So all of this intergalactic space, um, basically space between galaxies like Milky Way and the Andromeda, is filled with these filaments that you see and inside of them there's quite a lot of stuff just kind of staying there and most of the stuff is actively interacting with each other. Um, a lot of it is made up of what's known as ionized hydrogen, mostly because these regions of space are very, very hot and they create these very um, highly energized molecules. And a lot of this gas is um, essentially plasma, the same stuff that you see when you're looking at the sun. 
Now it's not as hot as the sun and it's obviously not as dense as the sun, but it obeys the same principles and still um, is relatively active as well. And one of the ways we've discovered all of this is because when we were looking at objects known as quasars, these really, really, really bright um, active black hole galaxies that emit a tremendously powerful beam of light, we realized that something was absorbing some of their light, but there was nothing in between those galaxies and us. And as the light from these quasars was passing through these filaments toward our own galaxy, some of the uh, light spectrum was absorbed by hydrogen that it passed through. And we were able to observe this and realize that these um, filaments are pretty much everywhere. And what's really cool about some of this gas is that it's never actually reacted with anything um, in a sense that it never formed any stars or any other objects. In other words, this gas has always been there since the beginning of the universe. And some of it will stay there forever. It will never become a star or any other object simply because our universe is expanding and this gas is slowly moving farther and farther and farther away from pretty much every major object in the universe. So some of these molecules will always stay just lonely little molecules. But anyway, what else do we know about this? So first of all, as I mentioned, these filaments form pretty much uh, these major structures in the universe, and some of them are some of the biggest structures we've ever seen, hundreds of millions of light years across, spanning almost the entire size of the universe. In between these structures, however, there are these really unusual voids. Now, one of the biggest requests I get on the channel is to talk about the Buddhist void, because I've never officially made a video about it. But I have made a video that you can check out somewhere above my head about the so-called local void, which I don't seem to see here, and that's because it's actually a lot smaller and a lot closer to us. But you can see it in this picture with our galaxy being right there in the middle. So these voids are the empty space, or the relatively empty space, in between these filaments. And essentially what you're looking at here can be sort of looked at in this way as well. We have these very, very large formations known as filaments, galaxies uh, connected to them, and then in between these filaments we get these very large voids, with the closest one being the local void. Buddha's void is probably one of the more famous ones, but local void is a lot more important to us because it's right on our doorsteps. And inside of those voids, once in a while, we do find a galaxy or two, but for the most part, they're kind of empty and don't really have much gas in them at all. And even in those filaments that I previously mentioned, the density of the gas is not very high. You could, for all intents and purposes, call it vacuum. As a matter of fact, it's even less than vacuum. Let me give you a comparison. If we were to take a cubic centimeter of volume, which is really, really small, it's just a little bit smaller than a typical sugar cube, and create vacuum inside of this uh, using um, the best technology we have here on Earth, there would still be roughly around 10 billion atoms on the inside. So even though we call it vacuum, it's not really vacuum. Then let's compare this to the middle of interstellar space, where Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 probes are right now. Here, vacuum can be anywhere between one particle per cubic centimeter to roughly around one million particles inside of these nebular clouds. So it's a lot less than what we can create here on Earth, but still, once again, not really vacuum. It still has at least a few atoms inside. However, if you were to leave the galaxy and then move to the region known as intergalactic space, this is when things get a little bit more interesting. The vacuum here drops dramatically. Here you would only discover one single atom in a cubic meter of space. And essentially there are roughly around 10,000 times less atoms than in the middle of the galaxy. And that's of course uh, where it becomes really interesting, because even though the density of atoms is much less here in the intergalactic space, because there is so much of that space and because there are so many atoms out there, it still forms about 50 to maybe 80% of total mass of the universe. So if you were to combine all of the intergalactic mass into one, it would be bigger than all of the galaxies together. And for many years now, we've been detecting these unusual interactions between various light coming into our galaxy, including the fast radio bursts, FRBs, that seem to be influenced by various um, parts of galactic filament as they pass through it. And the more interaction we see, the easier it becomes for us to map it and to start understanding the real structure of the universe. Not just a typical galaxy, the whole universe. Everything in it, including the mysterious dark matter and, of course, the visible matter known as baryonic matter. But none of this matter just kind of stays there. 
As a matter of fact, most of the intergalactic matter constantly interacts with various galaxies. The best way to describe this interaction is by showing you a galactic collision, although this is more of a very dramatic example, but here most galaxies they actually absorb this intergalactic matter into themselves constantly and they always get this gas as a kind of a replenishment for all of the gas they use up to make up other stars. So as the galaxy, as a typical galaxy, forms stars, and for example our own Milky Way forms roughly around 1.6 masses of the Sun every single year, all of this gas has to come from somewhere, and it usually comes from the intergalactic space through these connections via galactic filaments. So, in some sense, all of the galaxies are essentially connected. We're literally connected through these invisible bridges, and one day maybe we'll find a way to use them to travel across galaxies. But, like, really, really, really far from now, because we have no idea what's even in there. But more recently, we even started discovering things like magnetic fields in them, and a lot of other really interesting things like stars that we normally find in the middle of galaxies. And some of these stars are very important for us, such as, for example, Cepheid variables, that we often use for mapping galaxies and for determining distances. So there's a lot of really unique and a lot of really interesting things going on in these filaments in between galaxies. And even more, uh, we've discovered many different stars in the intergalactic medium, including stars between our own galaxy and the Andromeda. There are at least 670 stars that have already been confirmed, and I'm sure we'll find more as we keep looking. But even today, we still have more questions about this part of the universe than we have answers. There are still a lot of questions about the mysterious dark matter, a lot of questions about how these filaments were formed to begin with, and many other questions related to the uh, eventual fate and the evolution of the entire universe as it kind of flies apart and becomes bigger and bigger. So we believe that one day maybe the universe does kind of rip apart, and this means that all of these filaments will disappear as well. For now though, we don't really know. But what we can do today is continuously study these galactic filaments and of course the mysterious voids and at the same time simulate them here on Earth using supercomputers. And this way we'll be able to one day understand what's going on and how all of this will evolve in the next few billion years. Until then though, or until we understand a little bit more about our universe, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. You can check out the simulation I've used for this in the description below. And subscribe to this channel if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and universe, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. And maybe even consider supporting this channel on Patreon, because it does help me quite a lot. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.